Okay, so I'm going to take you through a presentation that I hope highlights the issues and ways that stagflation scarred not just the social and economic fabric of the nation, but especially that of New York City. Um, I think I've added this to the curriculum because it's pretty essential to me in understanding that stagflation is not just a term that we throw out from the textbook that's representing a phase of the Phillips curve, but is a real economic phenomenon that has serious consequences for people in the period of stagflation, but also for the way the economy behaves and the way the people behave well after the stagflation. Um, many of the issues that we are dealing with today as a city are directly linked to the decisions we made during the stagflation era of the 70s. <clears throat> so this presentation, how big business took the big apple. Let's take a look. First, let me take you through what we're going to be talking about today through uh, the steps of everything. First, the stagflation era of the 1970s is one of, if not the most pivotal turning point that defined contemporary New York City as a gilded city of capitalists. What do I mean by that? Um, from the Great Depression to the mid 1960s, the city was much more focused on labor investment. Uh, things like the Free Academy, which ended up becoming CUNY, transit expansion, um, the first public housing in the nation. Um, by no means do I mean to present the city as anything less than a still classist and segregated city at that time, but it was emerging into a more progressive and egalitarian place in many ways. And into the 60s, it started to get real support from the federal government in that direction as the whole nation was kind of moving in this direction. Um, the late 60s to the mid 70s, we started to see stagflation have a real impact on the budget, but the city doesn't necessarily make fiscally responsible choices. Actually, it's probably better to characterize that they made fiscally irresponsible choices in reaction to the pressures of stagflation, which harkens to my point at the bottom of the screen saying, keep this in mind throughout the presentation, the idea of costs going up and output going down. That's kind of the classic trait of stagflation is that costs keep on rising even as output quote unquote goes down even as people lose jobs even as the economy produces less and less goods and services prices are still going up so that has um, multiple orders of impacts on not just consumers and workers in the immediate environment but also on the governments around them on the businesses around them so keep these effects in mind as we go through this um, that stagflation, you know, is, it's marked by things like white flight, transit abandonment, the ghettoization of services, bloated pensions and strong uniformed unions, kind of the most nightmarish mix for trying to balance a really squeezed budget. On top of that, things start shifting against the interests of the city on the federal level with Nixon entering office around that time and the approach that he had and his administration had towards addressing climbing levels of inflation. Um, they were very, they were informed by poorly thought through economic models as much as they were the latest models of the time. They did not take into consideration how price levels interact with the rest of the economy and led to really, it, with hindsight, looking back, poor decisions from the, um, from the Nixon administration, all the way from the way that they handled increasing prices to the way that they tried to reduce uh, government expenditures. Uh, on top of that, changes in the international environment also put a lot of pressure on not just the federal government, but on every level of government below it. In response to all of that, New York starts the mismanagement. Um, we're talking about things like really overly optimistic revenue forecasts, even though the tax revenues just were not materializing to support these forecasts. And the numbers that were being projected were completely unrealistic based on evidence of what has come into collections in the past. Um, we're talking about borrowing for current expenditures on the city level, which 
is a huge no-no for city fiscal management. If your tax revenues cannot support your current city expenditures, then you that's typically a sign that you are using your tax revenues in a inefficient way. Theoretically, the tax revenues that you're generating should be able to support the services that the current environment needs to continue to support them with further tax revenues into the future or more tax revenue into the future. So if that is not occurring, if you find yourself in a position where you need to borrow, then you're either not taxing high enough or your tax revenues are not being are not effectively impacting the economy in a way where income is growing and allowing for more tax revenues to be generated into the future. All this comes into a a big clash with the fiscal crisis of 75. Uh, bondholders start to lose faith in the city and all hell breaks loose from there. City almost goes bankrupt, loses virtually all fiscal and political control that it had. And I really want to impress upon the political control loss. We're talking about people within the city not having a legitimate say over their elected officials as far as what those elected officials could even do to address the fiscal needs of the city. They were all but just like puppet uh, representatives at this one point in the aftermath of this crisis. And it pushed a lot of the management of the city's uh, finances and even some political decisions as far as where money should be pushed into what the priorities of the city should be into the hands of unelected financial elites, which leads us into what later on becomes an aftermath uh, of gilded of a gilded age for capitalists. In this gilded age, we're talking about tax deductions for the likes of um, the Trump family, who were huge real estate and continue to be uh, real estate uh, moguls, um, and a nonprofit sector that began to generate uh, Ironically, profits or at least income for uh, top level executives who were now in charge of addressing social issues that were originally addressed by the city. All that comes out of this is a new narrative where uplifting capital and in the sense of capital, I mean things like I mean real estate, uplifting uh, financial capital as well, right? Uplifting business uh, investment over the priorities of people in the sense of laborers. And you'll see how these uh, contrasts occurred when we go further through this uh, presentation. So let's take a look at New York City prior to the 1970s. And I'm going to give you a kind of wide uh, image or portrayal of this city, starting off with the city's free academy, which became CUNY, and this started up in 1845. So we're going all the way back to this idea that education in New York City, especially on the higher level, should be as close to freely available as possible with no financial barriers to entry. It clearly wasn't a perfect system, but this begins this concept that being a resident of the city to some level entitles you to access to the resources that we have available here and the understanding that if we provide that access, it will have ample returns back to the city and to future generations. Um, the city also was the first to really start up the concept of public housing in the United States. And up until 1953, we had a new public housing building constructed uh, Cooper Park houses, which I have pictured here. Um, the expansion of public housing represents this investment from the city into the idea that laborers here should have affordable access to job opportunities. And securing that access meant securing affordable housing for these folks. Uh, it's also interesting to understand that the history of NYCHA, right, it isn't as perfectly egalitarian as maybe we would want to understand it now, or I should at least say that it wasn't as geared towards poverty alleviation at the very least as it seems to be now. Um, when the first public housing started in the city, it was actually really created for middle 
income families. And there are a lot of uh, ways that the city actually tried to discriminate against allowing people of lower incomes to act, be able to rent units in public housing in the city. So some of the application forms would ask you questions as blunt as, are you a single female household, a single female head of household? Um, other questions that were kind of meant to filter out whether or not you were impoverished or whether or not you were in a broken, quote unquote, family. So it's very interesting how the role of NYCHA actually changed in some ways leading up to and throughout this fiscal crisis that occurred in the city. Because up until even the 1960s, NYCHA was not necessarily trying to open its doors to the lower part of the income spectrum. We can even take a look at the MTA's Program for Action, which was a plan that was finalized in 1968. Uh, it's very easy to forget that the MTA was actually, for a while, really expanding service and that the transit system here, as much as we kind of take like, as much of this kind of a love-hate relationship that most New Yorkers have with their transit system today, it was a really reliable and top-notch system leading into the late 60s. And they were efforts made to try to expand even further to really respond to congestion issues along several lines. Um, again, another sign that like the city level was willing to invest in the needs of laborers as far as not only access to housing, but also quick, affordable, reliable access to workplaces, to places for education. This was all this all kind of spins around the idea of if we help labor have a foothold in the city, then it will have infinite returns for us. There are other sides of the transit expansion too that were a little uh, maybe more mixed. So there was an expansion of the highway system into the 50s and uh, even into the 60s. Um, we're talking about, in this picture, the Cross Bronx Expressway, which was completed in 19, uh, 1965 or 1964. Um, it's, it's a double-edged, or I should say, it's, it, your reflection on this depends on your perspective. Um, as a person who is looking for access to work, access to educational opportunities, easier access between home and the places where things happen, highway expansion sounds great. A lot of people were driving around that point. Um, the car was being seen as a tool of freedom and the, the approach from Robert Moses and other actually elected policymakers in the urban design part of city management who was, yes, let's embrace this idea of the car being an open tool for people to get around and actually build that into the system of how the city works. But on the flip side, this often came at the cost of clearing out slums or quote unquote slums, um, disrupting the lives of New Yorkers who were on the less socioeconomically advantaged part of the spectrum. Um, in many ways, the city today, especially in the lower income areas of the Bronx, is dramatic or has been dramatically shaped by the intersection of highways crisscrossing all over the boroughs. Um, it has separated neighborhoods in ways that have been disadvantageous to people who don't use cars. Um, but in many ways, this does represent another step towards the idea of investing in the laborers and investing in laborers' ability to meet the needs of the city. And then finally, we get to even development that happened on the bis on the on the investment side, right on the for for firms this wasn't a city completely focused on laborers that would be a misrepresentation there was still the knowledge of the city being a major trading hub for if not the country for the entire globe a major hub of finance and that was represented even in investments that were occurring in to one chase manhattan plaza which was completed i'm pretty sure in 1965. Uh, the city was booming in many ways. The idea was that, yes, we do need to attract jobs. We do need to keep jobs here, but we also do need to make the city a place where working here is 
easy and we are as easy as possible and we're getting to work getting to wherever you learn getting to where you play is easy as well there's no point in having a city that has a huge amount of output if the people who need to make that city run to have that output can't afford to live here can't afford to travel to where they need to to make business happen and there was at least some level of balance on for that um, on the federal level there was support of course from JFK's administration and their new frontier uh, policy plan, which focused heavily on renewal operations for cities, helping them re-sculpt their environment and shape their environment for a more um, a more housing focused and accessibility focused future. There are also reforms, very progressive reforms in the JFK administration to social services that are often delivered by cities. So reforms to welfare, um, reforms to other social services, unemployment for uh, expansion. It was a very, from the top down, from the federal level down, there was this idea that the US is in a place where for people to really have faith that capitalism on a more macro scale, but even in a more micro level within people's cities and day-to-day -day lives, that this was a economic and social system that made sense and actually allowed people to thrive. That continued into Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society, which actually took the very forward policy position of we're going to now declare war on poverty efforts to eliminate poverty through the creation of medicaid and medicare um and other public policy uh, other fiscal policy moves that were just geared towards the idea of we can make this a really gilded society that we can make this a great society to use a term there where people don't need to suffer, where poverty does not need to be concentrated among the most elderly and the youngest. And in many ways, the policies that were developed there ha did have a major impact on breaking up the concentration of poverty in certain demographics, especially for the elderly and children. Uh, there are debates as to whether or not the war on poverty really did work. I mean, poverty still does exist. There's a question, does any war really ever fully eliminate an issue? But it's hard to deny that the efforts made at least had some sustainable impact. Now, moving on to the pivot point, the shocking 70s, setting up for a crisis. First thing I want to highlight for everybody is the is where we are on the Phillips curve here, because this is kind of the focus of the discussion, right? So we're talking about the 70s, which means that we are on the stagflation phase of the Phillips curve, or at least entering the stagflation phase of the Phillips curve. If you look at the graph on the left-hand side, you can see where 1974 is clearly uh, broken up. And you can see that that is kind of the quintessential beginning, the, the very clear beginning of entering this period where inflation goes up at the same time that unemployment starts increasing, right? And remember, unemployment's on the x-axis, inflation's on the y-axis. So going from 1974 to 1975, there is some increase in the rate of inflation at the same time that unemployment continues to go up. And I want to point out that even the, the change in inflation from 1974 to 1975 wasn't dramatic, at least the change in what the yearly, the annual rate was. But the fact that inflation was still in 1974 in excess of 9% a year, and then in 1975 is still in excess of 9% a year was what was so painful because at the same time that inflation remains so high, the job losses that were occurring were immense. We're going from an unemployment rate of around 5.5% in 1974 to unemployment in excess of 8%, almost 8.5% 8 by uh, 1975. So what's, what is also part of this setup, right? This is 
kind of where we are beginning with understanding the stagflation phase, but how does that manifest itself on the city level? Um, well, first thing to understand is that while this is happening, and even leading up to this, there was a lot of white flight happening. So the narrative that was opened up by the freedom of the car was now that people no longer had to live within the city limits to enjoy the benefits of the city. The ideal now was to get a single family house in the suburbs with a white picket fence that you and your spouse and your 2.5 kids and your small dog. And the pursuit of this ideal meant that a lot of middle income and high income earners in the city fled to the outer suburbs, right? To the areas of New Jersey, to the um, Westchester counties, to Long Island. This diminished tremendously the amount of tax revenue available to the city. Um, most uh, our most volatile tax is one of our most progressive ones, the personal income tax. So as the higher earners leave the city, it does take a huge bite out of how much tax revenue is available for everyone else and for other services. So as these tax revenues are declining, what's also happening is that subway ridership is declining. Now, the subway is one of those systems that is not easy to vary the capacity of. Once you've built the infrastructure, it is there. It needs to be used. It needs to at least be used enough that it justifies its existence. So if you built up the subway system, if you spend the last two decades, perhaps through a program for action, expanding the subway system and building up its services, the last thing you want to happen is that right as you're done with that, ridership starts to drop because that means there's less money coming into the fare box which means more of the upkeep of the subway needs to be covered by tax revenue rather than by fare box revenue. Now, it does happen regularly that most of the coverage for uh, public transit systems is coming from tax revenue, at least in New York City, more so than from the fare box. But when the ridership starts to go down, you have this unexpected need for more tax revenue compared to the size of the system. And it... It had, it had a profound effect. I mean, you can see in the pictures here, that the subway system not only lost its revenue, started to become one of those services that got quote unquote ghettoized. This idea or this, this concept of lower ridership presenting a more empty feeling that allowed people to feel like crime or at least antisocial behavior was more acceptable within the system. So in many ways, it took the form of a lot of graffiti on the, on the system, which is less, uh, less dangerous to anybody, but there are also higher incidences of robberies and other violent crime that accompanied this. So that's not the only thing that was uh, going down at that time. We also have uh, disruptions to the medical system, the hospital system in the city, which suffers from a similar problem where it's a system that can't be varied that much once you have the infrastructure that's there. So in 1967, Medicaid eligibility limits dropped the insured rates among residents in the city, which means that there were more New York City residents who were coming into the hospitals without insurance, which means that their care, or at least their stabilization, had to be covered by tax revenues. So these residents lose their Medicaid eligibility. More of them who are coming into the system, into the hospital system, need stabilization that has to be covered by tax revenues rather than by federal compensation. At the same time, the number of patients using the system drops. So the maintenance of a single building becomes more costly per patient the fewer patients that are using that building. It's a similar thing for the subway system, right? The maintenance of a single train car in the subway per rider is higher if there are fewer riders riding the same system. For the hospitals, the maintenance of the hospital per patient, the maintenance costs are higher with fewer patients. So you have fewer patients, a larger proportion of them live without insurance means a lot more of that coverage had to come from city revenues. At the same time, the tax revenues were dropping. Similar situation was happening with the public housing. The percentage of residents entering public housing on uh, public assistance increased over the same time period. This was in part due to the federal government basically saying, if you want us to help you 
in maintaining your public housing system, if you want us to help you maintain NYCHA, you're going to have to open your doors to residents who are of lower incomes. It makes sense with the priorities of what was going on at the federal level, right? We have JFK, we have LBJ, both at different periods, kind of pioneering this idea of we're going to be a progressive society that helps, that a society is measured by how it treats the most vulnerable amongst them. And we are going to prioritize bringing those people up with us. Well, that meant that more of the residents in NYCHA were on public assistance. Now, understanding how NYCHA works, you pay a certain percentage of your income, usually 30% of your income, and that is your rent. So as your income grows, your rent payment goes up as well which means that if you're on public assistance, if you have a very small amount of income coming in, then each resident is contributing a small amount of money towards rent, which means again, that the same building, the cost of maintaining the same building per individual resident goes up because each individual resident is only able to contribute a certain amount of their already limited income. And the percentage of residents who are on this limited income is going up at the same time. So more stresses on the tax revenues of the city as the tax revenues are decreasing. On top of that, CUNY was entering a transition phase where they were opening up their doors towards something called um, open enrollment in a sense. Uh, the idea that anybody graduating from one of the city's high schools should have access to at least a community college. Um, again, progressive move with great ideals in mind, but it, this, this CUNY system wasn't ready for the challenges of dealing with students who may have never self-selected to become college students until the opportunity arose in the form of, well, you have access to this university. So there was a lot more remedial education that was necessary that the CUNY had never had experience with dealing with. At the same time, graduation rates started to plummet because of this inexperience of dealing with this new population of students, which made the system seem even less effective at what it was supposed to do, which is provide a college education. So you have a costly education system that seems like it's doing a worse and worse job at actually providing education in this environment. And again, it's largely covered by the tax revenues of the city. And then finally, there was a the pressure from municipal employees, um, most notably was the pressure from the NYPD, which at one point in protest uh, for um, better pension benefits and wages actually had officers in plain clothes standing by uh, arrival gates in LaGuardia and JFK. And um, well, I'm sorry, not Jake. <laughs> uh, Revival Gates by LaGuardia and um, effectively handing out flyers to people with this image on it, Welcome to Fair City, with the idea being that if you don't meet our needs or our demands, we're going to do everything possible to discourage tourists from actually coming to the city. And if they do come to the city from ever being active enough that they spend enough money to generate sales tax revenue. So NYP thinks that a great way to get their ends met was to, uh, or a great way to get their ends met would be to basically take tourism hostage as much as they could. Uh, the effectiveness of that aside, it, it, it seems like almost cutting off your nose to spite your face because if the impact that this has on sales tax, which is a, a significant portion of the tax base for the city, the tourism generates a lot of money for the city. We export what we call export a lot of our taxes to tourists and outsiders who commute into the city. And the idea of telling people, hey, don't leave your hotel room after a certain time at night, don't go to restaurants in certain neighborhoods, just did not bode well for a future tax base. So again, when you're looking at this screen and all these things come together at the same time the tax revenues are declining, it's a really hodgepodge situation. But that was not all. On top of that, Richard Nixon enters office. It's 1969. They just, the, his administration just saw inflation creep up tremendously from 1968. And that trade-off with unemployment was very low. There was a very small drop in unemployment for how high inflation is going. They're thinking we need to cap down inflation at any cost 
necessary. So we see Nixon shock. With Nixon shock comes artificial price controls, which were an attempt to control inflation by putting a cap on the price of certain goods and services, including a cap on wages for some federal workers and decoupling the U.S. from the gold standard, which counterintuitively probably had an inflationary effect. By decoupling the United States from the gold standard, it allowed the U.S. dollar to free float as far as exchange rates go. And of course, with optimism for the U.S. economy in general, especially compared to other nations, there was, it's hard to believe that the currency was not going to actually appreciate in value over time. Um, but just decoupling from the gold standard allowed the dollar to change value in general and probably contributed to the rate of inflation as well. Not that it got stronger over time in the short term, but that decoupling from the gold standard probably in the very short term allowed it to fall a bit before uh, expectations about the future took hold. And caps on wages for certain jobs probably added to the level of unemployment because if, if as a person searching for a job, if wages available are not going to meet my needs as far as inflation goes, I'm probably not going to take that job, at least based on reservation wage theory. So on top of that, you get this new federalism approach from the Nixon administration, which basically involved turning a lot of social program funding from the federal government to what we call block grants, which effectively means if in the past you were getting a certain amount of money per person who, for example, needed to use cash assistance or needed to use welfare, and a certain amount of the money for that person's welfare was covered by the federal government, what happened now is that the federal government basically blocked off a certain amount of money that every state would get from the get-go period. Whether or not you had an increase in welfare participation was not a factor. So if you had 100 people using welfare last year and now it's 150, last year you got $50 million, let's say, just a random number. This year you're going to get $50 million or some other arbitrary amount that is not necessarily connected to how many people are on the welfare rolls. The whole point of what Nixon was trying to do, just to put into better context, was to try to create an environment that would be less inflationary. And his administration thought that capping wages, taking us off the gold standard, um, controlling the federal budget as far as these new federalism approaches would put less expansionary pressure into the, into the economy and would create some level of deflation. Did not necessarily occur the way they expected. Um, while inflation did slow down modestly, what really ended up happening more so was uh, that unemployment started to pick up a lot. Another reason why unemployment started to pick up and inflation didn't necessarily stop was because of the OPEC oil crisis. So OPEC enacted an oil embargo on nations that they thought were helping Israel in a war at the time. And that embargo shot up the cost of oil in, uh, in the United States, raising prices while reducing business activities. So while the price of oil goes up, it increases the cost of nearly everything in the economy because almost everything in the economy in one way or another is either derived from oil or depends upon oil for it to be brought to market. With that high cost, there's a reduction in activity because if it costs too much for me to bring something to market, I'm not going to bring it to market. I'm not going to bring a product to market just to have it then not sell in that market. So in many cases, producers decided to forego investment in inventory in light of what was happening with the oil prices. And this harkens back to our same point from before, this idea of costs increasing in the economy while output is dropping. So how does this manifest for the city? Well, we end up with the city having over a decade of overly optimistic revenue forecasts. A lot of this was the city seeing what was happening with their tax revenues and basically covering their eyes, covering their ears, and just saying, nope, it's just going to keep going up. We are just going to keep on 
projecting higher numbers. Uh, when those numbers would not come to fruition, the city would borrow because at the time it did not have any limitations on borrowing for current expenditures. So they would borrow to pay salaries, they would borrow to fund the pension, um, and they also kind of irresponsibly in many ways used capital funds for the current operating costs. So they would borrow for what they said was a capital project and basically shift the funds for that capital project into funding for current operation costs and then defer the cost of that capital project into the future. And to be clear, right, the investors in the economic system, bankers, the people who are underwriting these bonds, they knew what the city was doing. It was a very clear picture that was happening. It's just that at the time people were profiting, right? You profit from underwriting these things. You, as long as you're still getting your interest payment, you're going to keep on buying the bonds. The investors were not as concerned about the practices as much as the sustainability of the practice. And when it started to seem like the practice was unsustainable, that's when the investors started pulling out. Um, they didn't, those investors didn't trust the city to pay back its loans after a while. And that locked the city out of all the municipal debt market very, very immediately. Um, on top of that, investors started to have more choices as we entered the seventies. Uh, what started at first as asking for higher interest rates, that is the people who are loaning money to the city asking for higher interest rates for their money, turned into an outright rejection of New York City municipal bonds in favor of a growing global bond market. So as the entire economy started to become more globalized and investors started to have more options for safe places to keep their money, it seemed less and less appealing to risk money in the municipal debt market for New York City than to just seek it in some international bonds or even in treasuries for the federal government. So what comes out of all of this? Um, New York City almost enters into bankruptcy and needs dire assistance quickly from other levels of government. So from the state level, the governor creates what's called the Municipal Assistance Corporation or MAC for short, and appoints an investment banker, Felix Rohatin, to head it. Felix, uh, Mr. Royton had uh, died in 2019, and this was a very strong mark on his legacy. Um, he was well known for being the one who, quote unquote, saved the city from its financial crisis. And in many ways he did, but the costs were very interesting. So part of this whole package, right, in return for access to the bond markets through the Municipal Assistance Corporation, which now had the backing and trust of the state government, New York City had to take a few measures that you are probably more familiar with today as being called austerity measures. So New York City had to freeze wages uh, for municipal employees, had to lay off employees. And in many t ways, or in many cases, those layoffs typically targeted what we call uh, a FIFO approach, first in for, I'm sorry, um, a LIFO approach, actually. A LIFO approach, last in, first out which meant that the people who were last hired into many of these positions were the first ones to be fired. In many cases, um, the people who were last hired into these positions were people of color and usually people who had the uh, most structural barriers to the labor market. So in a very unfortunate way, socioeconomically, they were the ones who were the first targets to be kicked out of these secure jobs. Um, Mac also required that the subway fares increase and for the first time in CUNY's history that tuition actually be charged. So the end to the idea of the free academy for an egalitarian approach to education. And again, you might be familiar with these concepts today from what happened to Greece, what happened to Puerto Rico, this idea or this uh, situation where economies enter into crises, financial crises. Um, and part of the way that they're helped out of it is that they have to now really take drastic cuts to the things in their budget that benefit people on the labor side of the economy the most, um, with a lot of upward profit potential for the people on the capital side of this equation. On top of that, New York State created an unelected emergency financial control board, 
which had control over the city's accounts and the ability to remove elected officials. So even if city residents elected a mayor or member of um, the legislature who disagreed with the budget priorities of the control board, the control board had the ultimate say in whether or not finances would be spent in in a certain way. And they also had the final say as to whether or not that person would even stay in office effectively pulling all political control away from the residents of the city. So after the 70s, it's a very interesting time for the city. I mean, uh, the idea that came out of this in the media term was that New York City put itself in this position. And in, in some ways they did. The The fiscal practices were not on the up and up and were not true to protecting the interests of the residents of the city. But the idea that was really circling around was that the city put itself in this position by liberally financing social health and education services. And that drove the, the position of the federal government as far as dealing with the city. It became more of a punitive mindset, making New York City an example of why laissez-faire capitalism was the best approach and you can imagine in the context of a Cold War, this was a very uh, attractive idea for some policymakers. It's, if anything, the New York City was doing was closer to a more socially minded approach to economic management, then this was the ultimate opportunity to show that market forces were clearly what would save the economy. So this takes the form of things like Uh, tax exemptions for real estate uh, developers. So 421A, which was one of the tax exemptions that came out of this, an attempt to really attract real estate developers to build affordable, or at least to build in general housing in the city, but to try to build more affordable units. Um, In many ways, these tax exemptions that were really hopefully made with the intention of creating affordability opportunities for residents ended up being ways for real estate developers, including the Trump family, to use the public coffers of the city to line their pockets, which the New York Times has done an entire series of uh, exposés, let's even call them, on how Fred Trump was doing this even before this occurred. But this just became a even newer, uh, more recent opportunity for them to do that. And it is so clear with the way the Trump Tower was handled that uh, this was going to be a legis- piece of legislation that would be more beneficial to the capital holders in the city than it would be to residents living here. On top of that, with the city removed from provision of so- a lot of social services in the way that they would like to in a very thorough way, there was a new area, a new opportunity for nonprofits to start to take the lead in dealing with a lot of the issues, a lot of the city's social issues. And that allowed for a lot of uh, financial opportunity for nonprofit leaders. So for example, City Harvest, which is part of dealing, uh, whose goal is to deal with the food insecurity issues in the city. Um, Their executive director in 2018 received compensation of over $500,000. Uh, and many ta- and many often we think of nonprofits as a totally like we are here to help people approach and not really benefit in any way and this isn't to say that there isn't a desire among nonprofit leaders and workers to actually help people on the ground. But it is amazing how profitable a city's crisis can be for some people in these nonprofits. To make $500,000 off of uh, leadership, a leadership position in this is fascinating. Of course, the reason why these conversations are so high is because these nonprofits are competing in the same capitalist driven economy as everybody else for labor. So they have to also offer high compensation opportunities to get people to actually sign up to be members or leaders of these nonprofits rather than to go into more lucrative fields of finance or other business management opportunities. 
But then, I mean, that leads to situations where, for example, a failing educational system in New York City could be addressed by a charter school or a bunch of charter schools where the chief executive officer of one such charter school might make up to $650,000 a year. It's just a very interesting contrast to see people making these salaries on basically the back of crises happening in a city that was in many ways hamstrung from dealing with their crisis themselves. So that, I mean, th these weren't just uh, only victims of stagflation, right? I mean, stagflation also had other socioeconomic effects. Uh, Rockefeller drug laws were passed in 1973, basically a reaction to the drug-related or what was seen as drug-related crimes that took that kind of surfaced out of the high levels of unemployment and high costs of the era. Uh, of those imprisoned under the Rockefeller laws, 90% of them were people of color. So it was very interesting who got targeted by these policies meant to deal with crime control, meant to deal with the social ills of the time. At the same time, this was basically when a lot of political action organizations started to unravel. Uh, the loss in the 70s of the social fabric provided by regular employment opportunities combined with government subversion decimated racial liberal, uh, liberation political organizations like the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. The Black Panthers, for example, ended up splintering and forming into groups like the Crips and these... Uh, gang, well, these gang-based or gang-affiliated organizations that were in the face of high levels of unemployment now relying more upon drug enterprises to uh, finance just life in general, um, they would haunt the city well into the 80s and the 90s with uh, higher rates of crime and crime affiliated with drugs, but also violent crime as well. So in many ways, this just splintered from being a political action group that would help to progress or was hoping to progress the um, needs of special interest groups, uh, uh, marginalized groups in the country and became more of a deeper menace on the city. And again, this is like feeding, this is how the stagflation era fed into the issues that we're dealing with today. The issues of inequality that we deal with today are directly related to these decisions to create tax exemptions for capital holders versus for laborers, to create laws that locked up people of color who were, uh, who are more likely to be on the labor side of this equation than the capital side. Decisions that eliminated job opportunities for marginalized groups and forced them into having to enter the informal or black market part of the economy. At the same time, uh, the expansions of the MTA system, the things that were investments into allowing laborers to get from A to B and allowing this, the transit system to be something dependable, efficient, um, that got put on pause. The Second Avenue subway line, which was finished only a few years ago, uh, that Second Avenue subway line was a project that was started effectively in 1968. So it's fascinating how, and I mean, it wasn't started in 1968, but the leg of it that got finished recently was started as far back as 1968. So decades of progress that was put on pause by just the effects of stagflation in the country. And then finally, the trope of the Bronx is burning kind of comes out of this era. Community divestment, arson and divestment among financially underwater, underwater apartment buildings and looting during the 1977 blackout led to the nationwide narrative of communities of color being unsavable. Um, in some ways, there are experiments with approaches to management for cities where the idea was if we cut back services in these areas, maybe people will just leave them on their own. Um, some of the critics at the time called these, called these policy ideas more genocidal. The idea that the way to get people to, people who had built a home in parts of the Bronx, Brooklyn, the way to get them to move to the more salvageable part of the city would be to reduce their police services, reduce their fire services, reduce their transit services. It was, it was, there was a real contemplation of abandoning the people in these areas. Um, 
a tragic, tragic uh, relic from our stagflation era. This partial or this momentary flirting that we did with the idea of just abandoning people for being poor is frightening. Um, it's also, this is also a good moment to acknowledge that the Bronx is burning narrative was heavily influenced by this idea that arson was the primary reason why apartments were being burned down in large parts of the borough. And uh, historical evidence now suggests that a lot more of that had to do with the infrastructure of these buildings and the poor upkeep of these buildings. They weren't necessarily being all being burned down because of insurance claims that would be more profitable than the arts than the building itself. But in many cases, the boilers in these buildings were of poor condition. Uh, residents were forced to do things like keep ovens on to keep the heat. And that is just a fire hazard waiting to happen and happen in many cases. But probably a good moment to also point out that stagflation was not all that bad. Um, out of the 1977 blackout, a lot of, especially in Brooklyn and the Bronx, a lot of turntables are actually stolen from many uh, stereo and uh, audio equipment stores. And that actually led to the birth of hip hop in the form of a lot of basement parties being uh, conducted by um, African Americans as well as descendants or uh, immigrants uh, from Caribbean nations themselves. Uh, Arguably, without this economic stress, without this economic anxiety, it may have taken much longer, if ever, for the art of hip hop to actually manifest itself the way that we understood it then and understand it now. On top of that, the city did get its fiscal management under much more careful control. Uh, the New York City Mayor's Office of Management and Budget is a kind of testament to how this control exists today, where there is an intentional effort to make sure the budget is made in a responsible way that actually reflects the revenue potentials for the city. And on top of that, the power broker era of Robert Moses, this era of uh, just cutting through homes and boroughs with uh, highways came to an end as people became more critical of construction in their neighborhoods on the not in my backyard movements and a lot more aware of the impacts of development on their environment and wanted to see more environmental controls on potential projects. This basically destroyed the power and influence of unelected officials like Robert Moses. So now what? Um, Kind of my parting words for you on this. Stagflation in the 1970s set New York City on a new course, catering toward big real estate and corporate interests and relying upon a nonprofit industry to address social and economic problems, largely at the expense of working class and impoverished New Yorkers. Today, we're seeing immense economic growth and resiliency in New York City, and that will probably persist even through the most recent COVID-19 crisis. But will that ever really address our widening economic and education gaps, our segregation, or our housing displacement issues? Many would argue those are the truly lasting legacies of the road we paved by deciding to uplift capital and the interests of capital holders over the interests of day-to-day -day laborers. If we don't actually close these gaps, if we don't close the income education gaps, if we don't reduce at least the amount of segregation in the city, if we don't create stable and secure housing opportunities for people, it's, it's very uncertain where our economic future will go because clearly these issues have real ramifications beyond just their immediate economic consequences. The immediate economic consequences are bad, but if people don't feel like they have a fair opportunity in a democratic republic, if people don't feel like their children have a fair opportunity to actually do better than they can, than they have, then the populist movements towards leaders like Donald Trump and others who may make promises of futures that have no basis in reality, but turn us against one another is very real and may become a permanent fixture of our, um, of our political process. So hopefully this presentation has given you a better appreciation of how stagflation, the point in the Phillips curve where 
prices, inflation goes up as unemployment goes up, isn't just a phase in an economic phenomenon, but is also a real consequential part of how economies have functioned. And that the outcomes from stagflation, the the downsides of what may happen can be seriously detrimental, and especially to those who are most socioeconomically vulnerable amongst us.